paglipas ng panahon, may mga bagay na naiiwan, tahimik at pawang walang kahulugan. Ngunit bawat bagay ay may nilalaman, may kwento, may kahulugan. Sino ang umupo dito? Nagsulat at nagsimula ng himagsikan. Ano ang mga lihim na nakatala sa kanyang liham? Ano ang kanyang naisip, naramdaman? Ang kasaysayan ay ang makahulugang pagtala ng buhay. Tulad ng karanasan, patuloy ang ating pagmulat sa tunay, sa tapat. Ngunit paano natin mababasa ang buhay na nakalipas? Ano ang kanyang kahulugan? Ito ang pangunahing tungkulin ng Pambansang Komisyong Pangkasaysayan o National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Ang kasaysayan ay unang nabubuhay sa isip ng tao at ang pagtala nito gamit ang salita ay ang bumubuo ng mga kwento ng ating bansa. Yung mga karaniwang alam na natin sa history, pag binabalikan natin dito sa research, nalalaman namin, nakakadiscover kami ng mga bagong ebidensya na nagpapatunay na yung matagal na nating alam ay mali pala kung babalikan, no? yung mga especially mga primary sources. It, it makes history exciting din. May mga controversies here and there. Isang may away. <laughs> uh, nakikita mo kung paano nakipaglaban yung mga ninuno natin. No? Kung titignan mo, lahat pala ng mga nangyari, magmula pa noon si Hermano Pule, mga Basi Revolts, lahat ito, Iisa lang pala yung pinupunto nila eh, yung pagmamahal sa bayan. Sa pamamagitan ng pagsasanin at pananaliksik, ang mga natala ay hindi na mistulang salita. Ito ay nabibigyang buhay. Upang mabuo ang kwento ng ating bansa, kailangan natin ang dalawang simpleng tanong, ano at saan? Ano ang nangyari at saan ginanap? Sa pagtala ng mga makasaysayang lugar sa bansa, ang pirapirasong alaala ay nabibigyang kahalagahan at nagsisilbing kwentong kayamanan. Nagsimula lahat noong 1933. Sa panukalang bilang 451, binuo ang Philippine Historical Research and Markers Committee o PHRMC. Sinikap ng pamahalaan na matuklasan at makilala ang mga makasaysayang lugar bago ito mawala at makalimutan. Sa mga sumunod na dekada, lumawak ang katungkulan ng komite. Nagbago ang kanyang pangalan at nadagdagan ang kanyang tungkulin. Sabay nito ang pagbuo ng mga komisyon na inatasang ipagdiwang ang mga sentenaryo ng mga pabansang bayani. Pinag-isa ang mga komisyon sa komite at sa mga sumunod na taon, nabuo ang NHI o National Historical Institute. Mula rito, nabuo ang kasalukuyang NHCP sa pamamagitan ng Republic Act 10086 ng taong 2010. Kahoy at bato, marmol at bakal. Ang kasaysayan ay natutuklasan din sa mga labi ng panahon. Ano ang kanilang mga kwento? Ano ang kanilang mga lihim? Kasi yung historical items natin, paraho lang sila ng iba pang mga material things. So, pinubuo din sila ng elements at compounds, mga chemicals din sila na vulnerable to environment, na apektuhan ng, ng light, ng heat, ng humidity. Sa ating history, marami tayong mga pagkakataon na bumagsak ang, uh, bumagsak ang bayan, bumagsak ang ekonomiya. Marami tayong matututunan. So, sa pamagitan din ng pag-preserve ng ating items, nagsisilbi kasi silang paalala sa atin ng ating kasaysayan na uh, magiging susi sa ating pagkakalaya sa ating mga previous na mga pagkakamali. Bilang mga pamana ng panahon, ang pagsasaayos ng mga bahay, gusalit simbahan, ay pagpapatunay sa diwa ng ating kultura. Ang mga kwento ay nabubuhay muli at siyang nasisilayan. Ang kasaysayan ay kwentong tuluyang dumadaloy, sabay sa panahon, at tuluyan ring yumayaman tulad ng pagkatao.
din ng NHCP na ipagdiwang at ihayag ang ating mga natuklasan dahil karapatan ng bawat Pilipino na makibahagi sa yaman ng ating kasaysayan. Masasabing ang pagkatao ay masusukat ng kanyang paninindigan, malilikom sa kanyang pinanigan. Ito ba'y sa tapat, makasarili ba o makabayan? Sa buhay ng bayani, nagiging malinaw ang maari nating itugon. Na ang buhay na makahulugan ay buhay na makabuluhan. Na ang pagkatao ang tunay na kayamanan. Diyos maray na hapon sa gabos. Good afternoon everyone. I hope that you are all well and safe. I am Francis Imoreleda from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, the Museo Inchesa de Bredo, and I will be your moderator in today's webinar. Welcome to our webinar entitled Alat Ko, The Developments in the Public Transport in Bicol During the Early 20th Century. Founded on July 6, 1914, the, the Albert Louis Annan Transportation Company, or ALATCO, was the first bus company in the Philippines and the pioneer in Bicol's motorized public transport system. Improved road conditions in Bicol in the early 20th century were advantageous for the rapid develop, development of motorized inland transportation. It was in this context that enterprising um, American serviceman Albert Louis Amen realized the necessity of a reliable public transport business um, to assist the movement of people and the goods. This webinar aims to highlight Alatco's evolution and how its operation transformed various aspects of life in the Pico region. Right now, we are live at the Facebook pages of the following museums. We have the Museo de Chesa Robredo, the Museo ni Jose Rizal de Pitan, the Museo ng Kasaysayang Buholano, also have Museo ni Nahuan at Antonio Luna, the Museo ng Kasaysayang pang Ekonomiya ng Pilipinas, and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines Facebook page. If you have any comments or questions addressed to our speaker, kindly send it to us by using the comment section of our Facebook Live. So after the program, um, there will be a link um, for the evol evaluation form that will be posted at the same comment section. And please accomplish it if you'd like to receive um, an e-certificate. So without much ado, I'll now um, proceed to the speaker. So our speaker today is a graduate of Bachelor of Secondary Education major in Social Studies, cum laude, at the Ateneo de Naga University. He obtained his Master of Arts in History degree at the Ateneo de Manila University. He is currently a faculty member in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the College of Education of Ateneo de Naga University and the Ateneo Professional School and Ateneo Teacher Training Center. Last year, he published his research entitled the pioneering Alat company, mobility in the Bicol region in the early 20th century at the Philippine Studies Historical and Ethnographic Viewpoints of the Ateneo de Manila University. To talk about Alatco developments in the public transport in Bicol during the early 20th century, please welcome my college professor, Professor Leo Paolo I. Imperial. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, Francis. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, Francis. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank NHCP Museo Nijes Robredo, uh, Sir Mark, uh, Ms. Jean, uh, Sir Yuffie, um, Francis. Also, uh, congratulations in your recent uh, accomplishment. One of my best students uh, when he was in college here in Ateneo de Naga University. Uh, so today I will be uh, discussing chismis about 
uh, transport history in the Philippines. But seriously, I will be talking about the pioneering uh, Alatco bus company and how it transformed the uh, mobility in Bicol in the 20th uh, century. So please allow me to uh, share my, my PowerPoint so we could start. Is my presentation uh, visible? Yes, sir. So my uh, talk for today is entitled Pioneering Alatco Bus Company Mobility in Bicol in the Early 20th uh, Century. Um, life in the Bicol region for most of its residents uh, is structured around constant uh, movement. So efficient transportation has always been crucial uh, even to ordinary Bicolanos. A critical period uh, in the history of mobility in the region is the first half of the 20th century, which saw the beginnings of motorized uh, inland uh, mobility. Um, I collated uh, early accounts prior to the, the 20th century or in the early part of the 20th century. What was the condition of movement or traveling in the early part of the 20th century prior to the arrival of motorized mobility. And I, I found the, the works of Father James O'Brien, who pioneered and inspired cultural um, and historical research in the Bicol region. Uh, in one of the books that he edited, it was narrated there that uh, there were a group of students in Camarinesur uh, from, uh, or from Karamoan who were studying in Naga. And the students would go to Goa uh, and from Goa, they would trek Mount Isarog, and from Mount Isarog, they would go to Kalabanga, and from Kalabanga, they would walk or ride a cart uh, going to, to Naga, and it would take uh, hours. So that's one um, uh, a story that I got of the, the travails uh, or toils of traveling. Another account that I got was the account of uh, an American teacher who was assigned in Nueva Cáceres and Ambus Camarines. Uh, William Freer. Uh, William Freer uh, saw or observed that the indispensable carabao was the main or primary form of transport mode in, in Ambus Camarines. As he moved up north um, in Daet, he saw the sad state and, or the dismal state of roads. Uh, he even mentioned that the roads in Daet were worst during the, the rainy season. Two-wheeled carabaos uh, would get stuck, uh, ponies would get submerged in the mud, and even sometimes people would leave their freights or they would leave their, their carts and they would just walk and they would just abandon their, their carts. Um, no animal except the semi-amphibious uh, carabao could endure this ordeal. However, um, the establishment of a bus service uh, by Albert Luis Amen transportation company, more popularly known to Bicolanos as Alatco, addressed this, this predicament. So one of my goals is to, to, when I did this study, is to track the historical development of transportation infrastructure system, which provides a noble vantage point in historicizing uh, mobility in the Philippines. I observed that there were are actually very few studies on transport history. Uh, notable works are from um, Arturo Corpus. He wrote about the colonial iron horse. And of course, uh, Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Pantis' work on the Cucheros and history of mobility in the Philippines. So in the early years of the 20th century, the shift from water to inland conveyance enhanced physical mobility. And this could be attributed to the advent of inland vehicles and extensive road development programs, uh, which were actually outlined under the American colonial paradigm of modernity and progress. And in the rhetorics of American, when they colonized the Philippines, they would always reiterate that they were the, the givers of the harbingers of progress and modernity in the, in the Philippines. And amidst these colonial realities, the Alatco, the pioneering bus company in the Philippines, commenced its operation in the Bicol region on the 6th of July, 1914. So two days from now, we would be commemorating um, the 108th um, foundation of, of Alatco. 
uh, a lot code does not, does not exist anymore today, uh, but it has evolved into, it still exists, but the, the history of the company, it's now evolved into, because of institutional changes across time, it's now, it's, it's now the present day Filtranco. So if you have ridden the Filtranco bus, uh, you're not riding the 100 year old bus because of course it has also modernized, but it's one of, it's the oldest bus company um, in the Philippines, the first. Uh, bus company in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, one of my goals of this uh, to in pursuing this study is to broaden the historiographical landscape of transport system and networks in the Philippines. In this uh, short lecture, uh, I intend to answer these questions. How was the ALATCO formally organized? How did the company overcome challenges and develop into a new symbol of inland mobility in the Bicol region during uh, the 20th, uh, during the 20th century. So to provide more context, how it happened, how Alatco uh, operated, we'll also look into road building and the U.S. colonial uh, project. So when Spain relinquished its possession of the Philippines to the U.S. with the signing of Treaty of Paris on December 10 of 1898, the consequent U.S. colonial administration signaled a new era uh, in the islands. Uh, but even prior to the, the control of, uh, or even prior to U.S. colonialism, there were already substantial American investments in Kabikolan, uh, such in the Abaca, Abaca trade. As early as the, uh, the first half of the 19th century, there were already American and even British investors here. But as the U.S. colonial government gained authority over the archipelago, American merchant houses uh, gained control and enhanced the transaction in the Abaca industry. It could be inferred that clearly economic conditions motivated the Americans to occupy Bicol. Uh, to support the growing abaca trade uh, and to ensure shipment to Manila, the U.S. insular government allotted a substantial amount of money for commercial agriculture and uh, an efficient transport system. So this uh, early 20th century realities substantiated the fact that Good road systems um, are prerequisite to the American securing control of, of the island. Uh, with the U.S. insular government establishing American military administration in Bicol in the 1900s, they saw the value of Nueva Cáceres or Naga in controlling the entire uh, region. So American capitalist interests were focused on Naga. Uh, many colonial policies and even economic programs were, were situated in Naga. And for the nascent uh, U.S. colonial government, constructing roads, roads and bridges would pave the way for political and economic control of the country. Uh, moreover, in the ideology of the American, of American colonization, this campaign to accelerate road construction was an ideological instrument to portray American imperialist expansion as a civilizing undertaking. Like what I've mentioned, they always see themselves as the harbinger of modernity, societal development in the country. And to be able to uh, do that, um, the US insular government considered road construction as a top priority. Uh, when I was looking at uh, documents, um, I, I, I encountered that the very first ever legislation of the U.S. Philippine Commission uh, that was signed in the 12th of September 1900 was an act appropriating money. Um, how much? Four million pesos for the construction of repairs and bridges in the in the Philippines. So with that money, with that uh, um, legislation, they initialized the road projects in the country uh, and they crafted a general uh, road plan without considering geographical diversity of other regions in the country, the plan became a blueprint for constructing highways in Visayas and, and Mindanao. But the plan uh, was doomed to fail um, because of several reasons. Regrettably, the initial road plan did not stipulate any maintenance program for both the new and repaired roads. Uh, the insular roads, could not accommodate animal-drawn uh, carts during rainy season. Uh, even though they had 4 million pesos, it was insufficient to cover the entirety of the, of the project. Plus, 
uh, there were no there were no structured uh, there were no structured labor policies to support the project continuously and one of the main problem was the improper maintenance uh, program which caused the roads to deteriorate in just a year from the 1900s to 1901 it deteriorated gobbling up large amount of funds or the colonial funds here in the in the country or in the in the archipelago so we could say that from the 1900s up to 1903 the initial road developments in the country was in a sort of a trial and error phase but change happened around 1904 upon the arrival of Cameron Forbes as the new member of the Philippine Commission. Uh, Cameron Forbes was even nicknamed as the Caminero because of the program that he uh, established. So it was through his economic vision that signaled the, the, the revitalization of roads construction uh, in the Philippines. Uh, in, his, in his mindset, he was more onto economic projects in the, in the colony, the newly established colony of uh, US. It could be inferred that Forbes marked the heyday of public works during uh, the American period. He served as the Secretary of Police from 1904 up to 1909, and he took the highest position as Governor General in the Philippines from 1909 to 1913. And uh, he was instrumental for the establishment of the Bureau of Public Works and also the approval of the, of the road law. Uh, when he established the BPW or the uh, Bureau of Public Works, he pinpointed areas to, of emphasis where most of the project should be uh, done. Um, he reiterated that there was a need for constructing permanent roads that would last longer and require less maintenance. So he would answer the, the problems that was initially faced uh, by, the, uh, by the road plan. This um, ambitious comprehensive road construction project was consistent with the American colonial framework of development. Uh, Forbes underscored the value of road construction as an instrument of state building to reinforce and validate the professed boons of US colonialism in the country. So it was like uh, um, a sort of, a, a, in a way, a propaganda to promote that the Americans were here to do good, uh, despite also the atrocities that they did here in the, in the Philippines. Going back. Uh, so road building uh, and the abaca and the abaca trade in the in the Bicol region. Uh, as we mentioned, that one of the uh, goals of American colonization or American control of Bicol was to partake in the booming abaca in the booming abaca industry. So to maximize the potentials of the booming abaca trade many of the road construction and maintenance project in Ambos Camarines, in Albay, and in Sorsogon involved thoroughfares that were crucial to the, to the Abaca industry. So you could see that in, in the map, uh, the initial uh, roads um, that were uh, constructed would lead uh, to uh, the Abaca or would connect the Abaca plantations to the ports um, and even to the centers. So the completion of the roads proved to be of great assistance to the Bicol region, specifically for transporting and marketing agricultural products, mostly the abaca fibers. Uh, because the abaca plants were planted uh, in the foot of mountains where they would grow uh, or, or conducive, the environment is conducive for, for abaca to grow and volcanoes, uh, and the foot of volcanoes, uh, the plants need, uh, or, or the roads were built uh, on the base of, of these mountains. Um, construction of first-class roads uh, around 1912, uh, like the roads in San Jose, Tigaon, uh, Oas, Ligao, Binobatan, even in Sorsogon, in Bacon, and um, other parts of Ambus Camarines were made around or were, were finished or completed around 1912. So from 1908 to 1913, the shift from water to inland transportation was gradually uh, taking place as the construction of good roads um, reflected the movement of harvested abaca fibers. Uh, in Camarines, Iriga, a major abaca producing town, was linked to Naga through a road in 1913. Uh, and uh, to, to uh, the total length, or in Bicol, the total length of first class roads linked the abaca plantation reached around, when I was looking at the records in the Bureau of Public Works, it reached around 
470 kilometers in 1918. Uh, I'll show you the, the map. I think this is the, the map of completed uh, first class roads. These roads did not only invigorate the industry, but also offered suitable conditions for the arrival and utilization of transportation. So with good roads, there were also other things that came along aside from the economic ventures that they could gain from the from the abaca industry. Uh, this is the, the number of first class roads uh, in 1918. This was taken from the report of the Bureau of uh, Public Works. And uh, with good roads came automobiles. With, uh, interestingly, with minimal state intervention, private individuals and companies purchased different motorized uh, vehicles. And the uh, majority of the, the vehicles that were purchased based on the records were automobiles, there were freight trucks, and there were also uh, motorcycles. Uh, this new uh, forms of conveyance brought about technological, cultural, and even economic transformation in the, in the Bicol. Foreseeing the economic potentials of using inland transportation. See Forbes. Forbes believed that uh, roads and transportation would serve a sort of an advertisement for economic development or for people to engage in, in business. So that's, that's how he uh, uh, promoted uh, the necessity for, for good roads and also the advent of motorized vehicles. Uh, when I was looking at data uh, of uh, Inaga, who owned the uh, first motorized vehicles, I was able to find uh, uh, a uh, source about it. So in Inaga, many of, of course, well-off families were the first to acquire uh, motor vehicles. And interestingly, these well-off families, so that they could accommodate or they could have a place where they could put their uh, new vehicles, uh, transform their house, part of their house, into uh, a garage. So that was like the first uh, changes, mga changes in their in their in their house in their house. Among the first uh, popular owners of automobiles here in Naga, I was able to get the the, the names of the families, uh, the Abelias, of course, one of the richest uh, family in the 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century, the Arroyos, the Diazes, the Diliacos, the Lopezes, and the Militons were the first uh, owners of automobiles here in in Naga. Subsequently, the automobiles did not only enhance inland mobility, but of course, if you have cars, and it, it's also, it also became sort of a, uh, a status symbol. Uh, if you have cars, it, it would only show that you're affluent, you're, you're rich. Um, however, the success of motorization was not only seen in the number of vehicles or passengers, but of course, of its ideological uh, value. Motorization did not only signify progress and modernity, um, but also validates Americans' claim for benevolent, benevolent rule. So may mga, uh, another ideological uh, value where Americans would often associate with the, with the things that they brought to the, to the Philippines. Upon realizing the aptness of motorized transport to the newly constructed road networks uh, and its potential effects, in the, uh, in, in the urban life and economic activities in, in, in Bicol, uh, Bicolanos perceive motorized transportation as instrumental uh, in uh, socioeconomic mobility. And uh, these auspicious conditions, these changes, these uh, positive changes uh, in the built environment of, of Naga um, inspired enterprising American Albert Louis Amen to venture into a, a transportation business that was appropriate for the uh, completed roads. So who is Albert uh, Louis Amen, uh, where Alatco was named after? So here's a, a brief, I'll provide a brief background about Albert Louis, Louis Amen, where he came from, what did he do prior to owning the company, and also uh, an insight on his motives, why he established uh, an inland transport or inland motorized transportation business here in the in the Bicol region. So on July 6th of 1914, Amen formally launched Alatco in Ambus Camarines. But he was not alone. Behind the conception of Alatco was a team of enterprising Americans who, of course, saw the economic value 
of Bicol, and they were motivated by the viability of swift return of, of investments. Amen was together with his associates, namely Max Blaus, uh, William Bowler, uh, Richard Lawson, uh, Robert Manley, and Dean Lockwood. And they pioneered the transport service and this group of Americans uh, pioneered the establishment of, of Alatco. Arguably, is my inference, um, Amen's background as a former military personnel and his American nationality could have played a crucial role behind his decision to invest in a transport business and the eventual success of, of Alatco. Um, when he was assigned in the Philippines in the 1900, he was an officer in the Quarter Corps, Quartermaster Corps, which was deployed in the Philippines in 1899. But around 1900s, uh, when much of the country was already pacified uh, or under American control, Amen was then in Naga and was released from military service. Unfortunately, I was looking for documents uh, or sources um, to, to at least reveal the reasons why Amen settled in Naga. Unfortunately, I could not find any document why he settled in, in Naga. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's very unfortunate. Um, Amen might have reflected uh, what, what, what would be his motivations. Here, here are my inferences. Retired from his responsibilities in the military service, um, Amen might have re reflected on his campaigns as a former army, army sergeant. And uh, his troops look back into the harsh conditions, traveling together with his uh, uh, other Americans or the troops uh, who endured traveling on a rough and treacherous roads uh, riding their army wagons. He was probably bothered by the, by the dire conditions of transportation on the island, which uh, maybe he envisioned of providing better modes of mobility uh, to Americans and even probably uh, to, the, to the natives. Uh, he, early on, he realized that water vessels provided more efficient um, so, or, or they were more efficient mode of transportation uh, that he contemplated on actually establishing uh, a water transportation business in Ambus Camarines. Although these assumptions of on Amen's um, uh, assessment on the conditions on, on establishing businesses, I actually based it on the work of Louis Gleek. Um, who interpreted the American experience in the island. So Louis Gleek actually had a book that uh, he showcased all the early businesses that were established by the Americans here in the, in the Philippines. And most of these people were actually served the military. Most of the, the uh, businessmen who started businesses uh, in, in the Philippines were, if you look at their background, most of them had military uh, background. So as a retired army officer, it could also be inferred that Amen symbolized the shift in the American colonial strategy in dealing with the insurgencies in the Philippines. After quelling the natives' resistance campaigns, the Americans sought to, in a way, appease uh, the Filipinos by captivating their hearts and minds by launching businesses and institutions that introduced the natives to new products and also amenities. And like what I've mentioned, most discharged army men would focus on or would uh, invest in, in, early, in the early businesses. Um, most of them became businessmen and uh, they would uh, make conscious effort uh, for profitable opportunities uh, in the private sector. Uh, and they found it convenient to establish uh, businesses uh, that does not demand any professional qualifications or, or certifications. Uh, they often conceptualize business, just like Amen, conceptualize business uh, that were an offshoot of their official duties to the American colonial administration. Uh, although it's really very difficult to make conclusions regarding the actual motivation behind Amen's undertaking due to insufficient documentary sources, it's safe to say that his business decision was not purely altruistic or for the benefit of, or was he... Yeah, uh, looking for uh, the common good, looking for uh, what the Bicolanos benefit from, from this, uh, maybe partly. Um, 
of course, he was conscious of, of Beagle's value in the economic ventures in the American colonial administration. Uh, thus, he sought an opportunity to strike it rich in the region. As we all know that the booming abaca industry actually made many Filipinos or uh, foreigners, both Spanish and Americans, even the British rich uh, in, the, in the 19th century and even in the early part of the 20th century. So the emergence of American enterprise like Amen's company reflected and backed the increasing stability of US colonial rule and articulated its tenets of um, modernity and uh, economic uh, development. So in 1903, uh, Amin invested in a water transportation business. Inland travel was not yet possible during that time because the roads were not yet in existence in 1903. And traveling through the rivers was the most practical method. Uh, Rio Grande del Bicol, the Bicol River, cutting across major towns in Ambus Camarines was a strategic uh, and conducive to mass transportation um, in the province. Exhausting his resources, uh, Amen traveled to Manila and he purchased a flat bottom uh, river steamer, which interestingly, ang pinangalan niya, he named it Bicol, uh, which he immediately brought uh, uh, to the Bicol region. Uh, the, the ferry boat Bicol uh, ferried paying passengers over a short route of at least 40 kilometers from Naga to Iriga on the Bicol River. So from 1903 to 1913, it operated on a daily and was always in full capacity uh, as it catered to the Abaca producing districts in the Rinconada um, area. Amin actually profited from the, from the steamer line. Uh, however, for um, unknown reasons, uh, Amen left uh, around 1903 or around uh, 1908. He left and um, or around 1910, he left and uh, Max Daus, his associate, took over uh, the water transportation uh, business. After a two year stay in the US, Amen returned to Bicol. This was uh, around, he left around 1908 uh, and he came back uh, 1910. And he was astonished because uh, Cameron Forbes project was already in full operation. The Caminero project was already in full operation around this time. He was very, he was astonished to see that the road system connecting Naga to Iriga was almost uh, complete. Uh, so Amen and Blaus had uh, a, an idea that the completed roads could be an opportunity to expand uh, the transportation business by trying their hands on a land-based modes. So for a dry run, it's what they did. They acquired an automobile and had it um, run on the newly uh, constructed thoroughfare. So this experience of navigating the automobile in Nagan Iriga Road spurred Amin's interest to inland transportation. So the dry run was uh, gained or so that, uh, was, was very positive in the eyes of Blaus and also Amin. So determined to uh, actualize their plans, so Amen, using again his resources, went to or the profit from the water transportation business, went to Manila to search for automobile parts. Um, he first purchased uh, a Grabowski truck chassis and a Chalmers touring car for around um, 20,000 pesos. Uh, the Grabowski truck was a three-ton truck with two cylinders and, and, and motor engine block. Uh, so he, he, with the parts on hand, um, Amin and Blaus modified and assembled the, using the Grabowski and the Chalmers truck, uh, combining them, uh, they were able to create a, um, uh, a modified uh, vehicle. Uh, the vehicle that they made could carry uh, at least 20 passengers. Uh, Blaus took charge of the test drive. Um, during the initial testing phase, it's very interesting, uh, he had to overcome apprehensions such as that he would um, drive the automobile in the morning, unsure uh, if he could reach his destination on schedule or where, or where he would end up at night or in case um, the, the vehicle um, acts up, uh, he doesn't know how to, to fix it or when they assembled it, they, that was the worry, how to repair it um, at a very short period of, of time. But the dry run was again uh, successful. So witnessing a new, transport mode passing through this 40-kilometer road from Naga 
to Irika uh, when they saw, when Bicolanos first saw uh, this new contraption or new vehicle, Bicolanos had interesting reactions. Imagine seeing uh, a, a new uh, contraption or a new machine uh, traversing the streets for the first time. Uh, it, it's really uh, an, an kumbaga, astonishing uh, feeling. So the Grabowski truck was said to be the first automobile driven in the part of the province, Naga to Iriga route. At first, the public was distrustful uh, and feared of boarding the vehicle. However, people were surprised when they saw that it could complete a single trip, which wagons and the, the water steamer or the steamers could not accomplish in three to four, three to four days. Gradually, the natives' perception towards motorized transport uh, turned into a, a positive perception or positive response as more people began to ride the vehicle. And I was looking at some documents, yung mga first, the first people who actually rode uh, the, the, the vehicle that Lu Amen assembled, uh, many of the first time passengers actually got car sick uh, because of the, probably the new experience in riding this, this vehicle. So Amen and Blouse eagerly promoted the effectiveness of the commuter service uh, since uh, its operation was cost efficient compared to the steamer line. So they abandoned the, the steamer business and uh, focused on uh, the inland transportation uh, business. Uh, just to give you a sense of how the travel or the, the fare, the trip from Naga to Ligaspi cost around three pesos and 50 centavos with a travel time of approximately six hours. Can you imagine six hours from Naga to Ligaspi. Uh, at present, you could actually travel from Naga to Ligaspi in, in two hours or in less than uh, two hours or more than two hours, depending so if there's traffic and all. Uh, prior to 1910, the same trip by means of wagon could be made in two or three days. And back then, through wagons, it would cost around 50 pesos. And that was very, very expensive uh, during that time. So the existence of inland transportation service traversing Legaspi, uh, uh, for, uh, Legaspi posed a prospect for Albay's uh, abaca producing towns, uh, which had long been in search for cheap and serviceable passengers in the interiors. Uh, and uh, traveling via wagon from Legaspi to Binubatan of a distance of 18 kilometers, again, just to give you a sense of uh, movement during that time, it took three and a half hours and would cost around 25 pesos. And then the, in the introduction of these new modes of transport by Amen was a game changer. It, 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 it was cheaper and it was more, it was more efficient. And uh, because of the increasing demand and immediate return of investment gained from the initial operation of the bus service uh, with an average profit of, uh, based on the Alapco documents that I found, they, were, uh, an, they had an average profit of 40 pesos per day. Amen was uh, emboldened to purchase a second Grabowski truck. As the venture garnered profit and popularity, he seized the moment and systematically prepared for the expansion of the business. And to be able to do that, he would require investors. Hence, Alatco was formally uh, organized. So the formal establishment of, of Alatco. So to... Um, expand and sustain the service of the bus business and guarantee the financial returns of inland passenger transport service, Amen incorporated this business on July 6, 1914. Um, uh, a capital stock of around 150,000 uh, pesos was divided into 1,500 shares. And interestingly, prominent Americans and even affluent Bicolanos uh, were the initial incorporators of the Alatco. When I was looking at the, the census report, Around 1918, there were around 15 Americans that were residing in Naga, uh, including Alatco's incorporators. And who were the wealthy Bicolanos who invested in the, in the Alatco uh, business? Wealthy Bicolanos, such as uh, Bicolanos from Albay, uh, such as the Florianos and the Matiases, who were prominent political families in Ligao, uh, were actually one of the first investors in the Alatco and because they also took advantage of the prospect of the, of the new business. So, with the incorporation of Alatco, it enabled the consistent operation and prompted the technological enhancement to
to guarantee the safety uh, of the commuter service. Alatco actually took pride in the, um, in the safety uh, and efficiency of, of their bus trips. So in 1914, uh, Alatco was operating nine buses. They started when, upon the incorporation, they operated uh, nine buses. And uh, the initial route was Naga, Iriga, and Albay. Uh, because of Iriga's strategic position being situated between Naga and Albay, Amen designated it as the center of its operation, uh, where he stationed various departments uh, and services that could respond immediately to everyday concerns. And if the company and its customers uh, or we could respond to the needs of not only the buses, but also the, the customers who uh, and Iriga was a very strategic place uh, for, to address all these concerns. Like what I mentioned, Alatco had high regard for safety. Uh, to ensure the functionality and safety of the vehicles, um, it remodeled the initial uh, Chalmers and the Grabowski uh, truck. Uh, the wheels were improved. Uh, th these were the initial improvements upon the incorporation and uh, having more money to, for modernization or development or enhancing the bus. They, they improved the wheels uh, with air inflated rubber tires. Uh, they replaced the breakable wooden spoke ones with, uh, uh, with, with metal. Uh, and the Chalmers touring car, an open carriage, uh, was enclosed and replaced with Filipino made polished metal. So, my covering, my, my roof, na yung, uh, uh, initial bus. And this was the, the remarkable makeover in the first year of, of the company. So uh, when the insular government began issuing transport franchises uh, in 1917, Amen instantly secured one because he recognized that Alatco was growing and also other American entrepreneurs uh, in various provinces also began operating bus lines. So in a way, uh, the Alatco company served as uh, a model for other transportation companies that uh, were established. Uh, I'll just name a few like Frank Clark's uh, Pangasinan Transportation Company. Uh, by 1918, Walter Scott established a bus company in Leyte. And Emil Bakrak, an automobile magnet who was responsible for shipping the one of the first automobiles or motorized automobiles in the Philippines, also launched the rural transit company uh, in Nueva, in Nueva Ecija. Uh, and even Blaus, the former partner of um, Amen, also uh, went to Batangas to start the Batangas Transportation Company around 1923 and the Laguna Tayabas Company uh, in 1928. And most of these companies possibly imitated the same organizational structure and the centralized management of, of that, that the Alatco uh, employed. So it inspired other, other bus companies uh, outside uh, Kabikolan. So we go to Alatco's growth as a, as a company. With uh, the profit uh, and uh, taking pride on safety and their efficiency, um, the efficient service of Alatco translated to passenger satisfaction, which in turn assured an increase in revenue and capital for the companies or for, for Alatco. Moreover, the Alatco was keen on on time was keen on time management. They were uh, they when I was looking at the, the data, they made sure that the, the trips were were spaced um, and, and to ensure the continuous flow of nine buses at a regular interval. The Alatco buses arrived and departed uh, on schedule, and they would leave the terminals. Uh, when I was looking at the, the travel records, they would leave, leave the terminal as early as 3.30. There were already trips as early as 3.30 uh, a.m. And the last bus would return around 8 p.m. Uh, each day. So buses uh, operated on a regular uh, service with half an hour headway uh, on its Naga, Iriga, and also Albay, Albay route. I'll show you the... The map of uh, where I plotted, of where I plotted uh, the terminals uh, based on the, the documents that I gathered. So the improvement of transport infrastructure and acquisition of new buses significantly uh, reduced headways uh, and uh, by at least an hour. So with more buses, uh, travel could be scheduled. Uh, and uh, here are 
I'll show you the data, uh, the increase in, in buses. So from nine, uh, it increased to 122. And in the 1940s, uh, there were already 261 buses that are traveling uh, in the Bicol route uh, alone. So with the constant increase in the bus units, the Alatco routes became more dependable and cheaper. During Alatco's initial years, the Naga to Iriga trip cost around four centavos per, per kilometer. Okay. Um, and um, while Naga to Ligaspi, uh, uh, tickets would cost around uh, 10 centavos per kilometer. Uh, by this time, uh, traveling via bus was more economical compared with the water vessel. So you can see here the transition from water to already inland uh, conveyance. Uh, but uh, there were also um, regulations in, in, in the fare. Actually, that was, that was one of the, uh, also the problems that Alatco and other bus companies faced, how to standardize um, the, the fare. Uh, so the PSC, the Philippine Service Commission, were actually the one in charge of, of the fare or, or, uh, or uh, regularizing or standardizing uh, the fare. Uh, so it was uh, at, at one point, it became one centavo uh, per a kilometer, but some bus companies were appealing to increase it by 1.5 or by 2 uh, centavos. But Alatco um, had its own sort of, uh, they did not, at one point, they did not confirm with, uh, with the standardization of fare by the, by the PSC. So, aside from the affordability of the commute, um, one thing that people uh, were satisfied uh, of, the, of, of the operation of Balatco was the uh, management so, or safeguarding the, the roadworthiness of, of, of its buses. Uh, Amen prioritized and take pride in monitoring Alatco. Alatco's record so of safety. To, uh, At the main shop in Expand Iriga, and sustain the, uh, were actually the one trained Bicolano mechanics conducted periodic checkups and repaired vehicles to avoid roadside uh, breakdowns or minimize uh, accidents. In all Alatco terminals in the region, uh, the management required this inspection method. They had this so-called, when I was looking at this uh, document, uh, it was mentioned there, the once over, uh, which was a maintenance scheme that Alatco was, was pursuing. In this maintenance scheme, uh, the mechanics inspected the buses every night in the, in the Iriga garage to ensure that they were fit to operate the next day. So the bus company transported an estimated of around 12 million passengers a year without fatal accident recorded from the 1930s to 1937. Uh, regrettably, uh, I have not found any primary uh, sources to vouch for the Alato safety from its initial operation or even from the 1920s and the 1930s. So there were only no fatal accidents that I found in newspapers um, and also other sources from 1930s to 1937. But I, I presume there were accidents uh, in other decades or in other years. But uh, amid all this um, acclamation uh, for the Alatco service, there, the, the company was not perfect. There were also imperfections uh, that uh, its consumers or its, its client uh, complained about. Such issues on comfort and in sanitation that led to public's negative, the public's negative impressions, uh, which the company initially dealt with. So there, I, I found this local newspaper uh, that featured an article pertaining to several complaints about the comfortable seats and the lack of uh, cleanliness inside the buses and terminals. Um, but Alatco immediately addressed these uh, issues of discomfort. Uh, the company replaced old buses with seats with padded backrest. Uh, probably not yet the lazy boy type, but at least they were, there were cushions um, to, so people would not complain of back pains. Uh, to remedy the issues of littering inside the bus, the buses, and in, even in terminals or in waiting areas, the management and personnel uh, reminded passengers to properly dispose of their trash in bins and refrain from throwing garbage out the bus windows. And uh, that was a problem before and it's still a problem uh, today. Uh, I also encountered uh, a news article that featured a complaint about the, the stinking restrooms in the Alatco terminal in, in Daet, Camarines Norte. 
uh, it described an an unhygienic uh, scene. Uh, so if there are people who are eating, uh, excuse me, I, I apologize. But in the description, the laboratory had an awful smell, uh, worse than a pig's thigh. So you, you just vividly imagine uh, the smell and even the how it looks. Uh, if one was not careful, he or she could step on human excreta scattered around the comfort room uh, because uh, what was the reason for this? Hasty passengers were forced to dispose of their waste in a restroom that had nothing to offer than urinals. So there were only urinals. There were no uh, toilets where people could, could use. Uh, so the laboratory, uh, so, uh, as a, as a uh, remedy to this problem, the laboratories were padlocked at night because the, the, the crimes uh, would happen uh, during the night. However, I was looking uh, data to show if Alatco addressed these concerns. Unfortunately, I did not find a succeeding report how Alatco addressed this concern in, uh, in the comfort rooms or in the toilets in, uh, in Camarines Norte. So, uh, so as you can see, there were not all positive things, despite the efficiency and also the, the, the safety uh, there were also some problems that Alatco faced and comfort sanitation uh, were one of them. But undeniably, Alatco transformed Naga and the rest, the rest of Capicolan. So the modernizing process that accompanied the progress of Alatco's operation was closely related to the American notion uh, that changes in mobility would also bring changes in Philippine society. So that's the, the, the perspective, the perception of the Americans. These supposed achievements were apparent in the demographic, um, uh, demographic shift. So here are just some notable changes that Alatco uh, was, was uh, or, or an implication of Alatco's uh, operation. So there were demographic shifts, there were political integration, and uh, there were economic ventures, and also urban transformation that occurred not only in Naga, but the rest of the, the Bicol region. So with regards to rapid population growth in the 20th century, uh, Bicol can be construed as a response to, or this could be construed as a response to political consolidation and also economic activities that went hand in glove with the transport uh, development. Uh, Alatco's operation had a crucial influence on the movement of people or the demographic changes and also the urban advance, advancement in the region. Its services aided and enhanced regular movement of people coming from various towns. Uh, particularly, most of these movements would occur in the abaca producing districts, of course, for occupational and eventually relocation purposes, which uh, resulted in intensive and extensive uh, agricultural land use and apparent shifts in population. So most people would prefer to live near the abaca plantation because they could get their income there. And through Alatco's uh, uh, efficient uh, transportation, they could take people there uh, at a shorter amount of, of time. So urban and interprovincial inter transportation had a decisive role in how and which in towns and cities would develop. Um, instrumental then ang Alatco for the for the uh, for the development or the significant demographic shifts or the development also or political integrations of town. Uh, because Alatco strategically, if you uh, refer back, you'd refer back later to the, the map, uh, the terminals of Alatco. Alatco strategically positions it in its terminals and devised its routes to service the abaca producing districts of Ambus Camarines, Albay, and, uh, and Sorsogon. As the demand for, for abaca fibers reached its peak, in the early decades of the American period, Albay and Ambus Camarines attracted people seeking for better opportunities. So it became source of a, a pull factor. So the abaca industry served as a pull factor and aiding that pulling of people in Albay and also Camarines or was of course Alatco. So by 1918, the Alatco serviced and designated travel routes that would traverse the highly populated abaca producing towns, uh, specifically of Buhi, Iriga, Lagunoy, San Jose, and Antigaon in Ambus Camarines, and also the towns of Ginubatan, Tabaco, and Ligao in Albay, 
uh, and its route planning uh, reacted to the pattern of economic acti activities that were taking place in the region, uh, primarily focused on the, the, abaca, the abaca industry. Uh, but it was not only abaca uh, that attracted or, or that, that became a viable business opportunity here in Cabicolan. So aside from the abaca industry, the lumber businesses uh, was one of the most profitable ventures in Bicol in the second decade of the 20th, of the 20th century. So the combined, uh, uh, most of these logging firms were, were located in Camarines Sur and Camarines Norte. And they were around, the, around 1939, when I was looking at economic data, it was, uh, they were, uh, the worth of these companies was around 7.2 uh, million uh, pesos. So the lumber trade in, the, in Bicol necessitated a large labor force, uh, which that same year uh, was composed of around 4,000 4, workers uh, to work in the, in the lumber industry. Alatco serviced, Alat Alatco serviced, enabled the easy movement of laborers from their homes to the warehouses uh, or hardware stores and uh, situated in Naga, Daet, in Camarines Norte, uh, and um, and among the there were actually uh, a popular uh, hardware shop in Naga, uh, the Marsman Development Company, which was an American company, and also Mariana Villa Fuertes uh, Villa Sol Lumber Mill, who was very uh, profitable uh, during this period. So uh, the development of transportation facilities did not only benefit the abaca industry but also uh, and bring opulence to the abaca producing towns of Camarines and Albay, but also enabled, uh, aside from lumber or, or mining uh, or lumber, there was also the mining industry, uh, which were focused on uh, Camarines Norte, specifically Paracale uh, and Mambulao. Um, so uh, this mining, uh, uh, it, it created the operation of Alatco created an, uh, an atmosphere favorable to, to mining investments. Uh, I, I was looking at um, early investments in the mining industry. Uh, by 1916, uh, American and Japanese investors and companies began to examine the mining sites. So mostly well, uh, Japanese companies and also American companies uh, were established in, in Camarines Norte. Alatco was instrumental in transporting people in search for employment in sprouting mining companies in Paracale and in Mambulao. Uh, by, the, by the 1920s, uh, the mining operations were in full swing and required hundreds of workers. Uh, prior to the mining boom, so hindi lang, uh, it was not only the abaca, abaca boom that happened, there was also a mining boom in the, in the early part of the 20th century in Bicol. The Alatco, uh, prior to the mining boom, Alatco had just one bus station in Camarines Norte. Thus, to give people access to the mining sites, the Alatco constructed bus stations in Vinsons, uh, in Paracale, and also in Mambulao. So uh, workers could instantly uh, go down from, from these bus stations where these are very close to the, to the mining companies. Hence, uh, passengers uh, seeking jobs in the mining firms coming from even from Sorsogon and Albay um, could take an Alatco bus and directly alight in the mining town. So they, they, they don't have to transfer from one mode of transportation to another. So the Alatco was very flexible and they could uh, bring them uh, to, the, to the mining sites. Uh, well, in, this was in Camarines Norte, but uh, what about the towns uh, near Naga? Specifically, Kamaligan, Gainsa, uh, San Fernando, Pasacao, uh, also profited from the presence of inland uh, transportation. Pasacao uh, was a port of entry of goods and, 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 and laborers destined from Naga and other towns of, of Camarines Sur. Uh, traders from the said towns had a chance now to transport a substantial amount of their local harvest uh, to be sold in the respective town centers and also a bulk that was uh, a bulk of local produce was sold in Naga. Uh, so it was more efficient to, to move the goods uh, instead of from the water, uh, water uh, from water, it, was, it became more convenient to move it via inland uh, transportation. Um, other industries that sprouted in Naga were 
um, automobile businesses uh, who they were they were already businesses that were selling selling car parts and probably they were selling some parts to uh, to to Alatco. Uh, there were also uh, gasoline uh, stations uh, that emerged in, in Naga and also in uh, in Albay. And also there were uh, 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 several auto repair shops that 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 emerged uh, in Kabikolan or in the Bicol region. So apart from transport-related industry, Alatco, uh, Alatco's rise expanded customer reach of specialized commercial establishment. For instance, um, Bicolanos in different parts of the region now had access to public and private hospitals uh, and uh, the uh, hospitals in, in Legaspi, which was acknowledged as the medical health care center in the region around the early part of the, of the 20th century. Uh, there was the Santa Teresita uh, Hospital and also the Presbyterian Hospital where people not only from Albay, also from Camarines could, could uh, have access to the medical um, um, supplies or medical uh, expertise of these uh, hospitals. Uh, other industries, uh, people in Albay, there were people who invested in, in wine businesses, uh, chocolates and other imported goods. Uh, a store that I got, the El Barato, uh, interesting store uh, in, in Albay where people could actually go. It, it, it helped the business boom because of uh, travel and they could access these places in, in Albay to get uh, uh, or have uh, at least a taste of these uh, products, wine and even, even chocolate. So uh, the positive effects of road building and transport motorization were not felt uniformly. Uh, there were also uh, instances uh, that other sectors in societies did not benefit from the new forms of mobility. Uh, this case was evident when the Alatco bus displaced non-motorized vehicles. Uh, so in general, Alatco's operation uh, amplified or led to the marginalization of non-motorized vehicles or non-motorized uh, modes a process that, what, that was not just technological in nature, uh, but could also be inferred to as political as well uh, due to the institutional advantages enjoyed by the, by the, by the newer vehicles. So buses um, would service more passengers and charge less than horse-drawn uh, modes of transport or, or yung mga kocheros, mga karwajes. Uh, and this disparity in fare rates um, made horse-drawn vehicles unvi an unviable uh, uh, business. So the perception of the insular government towards traditional transport modes was a clear indication that uh, there was institutional bias um, uh, against non-motorized vehicles. Even uh, Cameron Forbes, uh, in part of the road law, he actually banned um, horse-drawn carts uh, to... Uh, passed by the newly constructed uh, first-class roads because there were reports that the wheels of the horse-drawn carts would dig deep in the macadamized or newly paved roads that could damage the road. So that, that became uh, a sort of a menace um, in, the, in the projects that were, uh, or the Caminero project or the road construction project instituted by the Americans. Um, plus, traffic regulations and ordinances amplified the marginalization of horse-drawn vehicles by hindering the further utilization of animal-drawn contraptions on concrete roads. Yeah, and it, that was actually part of the, of the road law. With the intervention of the government, motorized vehicles were given priority to pass by first-class roads. Uh, there were um, camineros, capataces, who would uh, look after the first-class roads and they would immediately seize or stop uh, carts from passing the roads. And they would only allow inland motorized vehicles to, to pass. Okay. So these were uh, some of the changes that were not so positive because it tend to marginalize uh, the other form or the traditional form of transportation. Um, yeah. So Alatco was not the, the only public uh, transport system uh, during that period. There was an earlier, the train, uh, the MRC, the Manila Railroad Company, so 
Alatco, uh, both of these companies were providing um, public transport service. And at one time, uh, uh, early on, there was a clash between these two companies because they were, um, in terms of patronage by, by uh, commuters, uh, which was more efficient, which was more effective, who could get them to their destination at a, uh, at a shorter amount of time. So there was a, a short rivalry between Alatco and also MRC or the Bicol uh, Express. So during the American regime, the insular government controlled and expanded the railway system. Uh, however, the Commonwealth government who had an aggressive campaign on Filipinization of industries imperiled American uh, ownership of public transport services in the islands. There were positions that were formerly, uh, uh, um, formerly Americans would uh, take this position, but with the rap, with the uh, aggressive campaign of Filipinization, Filipinos were also uh, allowed to take this position. So it imperiled the, 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 the position of American uh, investors. So to protect and sustain American capital interest, Alatco and the MRC engaged in collaborative efforts. So Alatco buses supported the services of the MRC as, rail as railroad feeders that facilitated the stream of passenger traffic. So the Alatco op uh, operated connecting services with the MRC uh, from like uh, in the case of Sipokot to Paracale, Mambulao, and all other points in Camarines Norte. And of course, from Naga to all points in, in uh, Camarines Sur were serviced by, by Alatco. But before embarking, uh, what I mentioned, there was a, a sort of a clash between these two American companies. Um, before embarking on a joint uh, passenger service uh, with Alatco, the MRC initial response to motor vehicle competition was to abandon an uh, unprofitable uh, branches. They could not keep up with the, with the flexibility of Alatco. So there was this one report that in 1914, the Legaspi Tobacco section of the MRC uh, was abandoned because they could not keep up with the motor vehicle rivals. Uh, with the increase of bus lines and, and truck competition, this portion of the railroad became uh, risky and unprofitable. So MRC decided to abandon uh, this company. But MRC uh, learned from Alatco's business model. So they looked at Alatco's business model. And the Manila Railroad Company also ventured into a motor business. So if you cannot beat them, uh, why not emulate them, copy them, or, and later on uh, and join them? So uh, in 1930, the MRC acquired uh, the Pasacao truck line. Uh, a privately operated freight and passenger service uh, with one bus. Um, and uh, it operated from Pasacao uh, to Pamplona. Uh, unfortunately, the operation of the Pasacao truck line was short-lived because, again, MRC could not compete with the flexible service of, of the Alatco. Uh, but the rivalry between Alatco and MRC was but temporary because these two American transport companies eventually collaborated to secure their mutual interest. Like what I mentioned, the campaign for uh, the massive or the aggressive campaign for Filipinization imperial American control of these two companies. So they had to work together. So to sustain uh, or to keep up with the pressures of Filipinization or the, the Commonwealth government during the time. So instead of abandoning unprofitable sections of the Manila South Line, the, the MRC, which the Manila South Line extends up to Bicol, uh, they struck a deal with Alatco. Again, if you cannot beat them, join them. Uh, in the arrangement, the Alatco had sole control of the commuter service, while MRC's trucks would facilitate freight tra traffic, uh, like in the case of the Legaspi Tobacco Station. So by 1939, there was a combined uh, passenger service arrangement between uh, Alatco and the MRC as they connected the Sorsogon bound bus routes with the Raga Railroad Station. So they were uh, anyway, complementing uh, each other. While the Camarines North bound uh, bus routes uh, with, uh, was connected with the Sipokot uh, Railroad Station. So the Alatco Station was suited close to the um, mining companies uh, with, uh, so the buses uh, recaptured and expanded the market of the train service by linking populated towns uh, to train stations. And both entities, both Alatco 
and MRC profited from this uh, joint venture. And that was because uh, the cost effectiveness of the bus, the efficiency um, in traffic, in navigation, and flexibility and capability of making stops between stations, and even near road intersections at any time were qualities that made Alatco's commuter service more profitable than the, than the passenger than the passenger train. So furthermore, um, the rivalry between the MRC and the Alatco quickly fizzled out. Uh, the two transportation companies had to reach a compromise to ensure that American enterprise controlled the business transaction uh, and the profits uh, to be gained. And most of these profits uh, were controlled by uh, American uh, businesses. Uh, kaya, they were they, they merged uh, eventually. Oh, short, very short-lived lang yung rivalry between Alatco and the, and the Manila Railroad Company or the Bicol Express in the case of Bicol. So in, in, my, in my research, now this is one of the most difficult part of my, of my research, I was looking for accounts of bus rides to complete the, the experience of riding a, a, a bus because most sources were, came from the lens of uh, American colonizers, institutions, and even American controlled companies. I, I, I collated accounts of the early uh, bus, uh, bus experience. So in determining Alapco's effects on Beagle's rhythm of life, uh, this research uh, collated uh, sporadic and general accounts on Beagle from various individuals who experienced going around the region via bus. Uh, taken from, I got a few from native travelogues or native accounts and also American travelogues. Uh, there were also journalistic accounts, uh, reports, and even memoirs from 1926 to 1939. Um, fundament fundamental to the colonial uh, representation of public transport motorization was the American imperial perspective that they were the harbingers of progress. And that was like the pattern in most of the American accounts that I got, uh, that I got uh, in sharing their experience in the in the bus. So I'll, share, I'll just share a few of the exp of bus experiences. Um, a go-to source in, in Bicol, uh, history and culture, was the edited work of Father James O'Brien. And um, I got there an account of an inland and maritime travel from Manila to Bicol uh, by means of train, steamer, and bus. So utilizing water and inland transportation. This was around 1926. So in the account of uh, Father O'Brien, or on the compilation, the work that he edited, there was an account there that the Manila Railroad Company or the Manila Railroad went by as far as Aluneros, Quezon, where Bicol-bound passengers would disembark and transfer to the Pasacao-bound steamer. Uh, and the, the steamer was actually named Mayon and, and Bicol, which was, I, I, I presume that this was different from Amin's flat bottom steamer, na Bicol, because it was not anymore operational during this time. Uh, from Pasacao, travelers would board an Alatco bus going to Naga and Pamplona, uh, while Albay-bound passengers could board a train, um, a train to from Pamplona Station, uh, and, and prior to the completion of the Southern Line uh, route, that transferred uh, transferring from train to steamer and bus was considered the most efficient way to travel uh, to Manila and back to Bicol. So, so can you just imagine? traveling from Manila to Bicol, you would take three forms of transportation. Nowadays, you could just take the bus. Uh, it would only take uh, a good eight hours, then you could reach uh, Manila. Uh, another account um, that was in the American Chamber of Commerce Journal, art, uh, an article depicted the progress of the Alatco uh, that in a way supported O'Brien's, uh, Father O'Brien's collated narrative. Uh, it narrated that Alatco um, methodically organized highway transportation in Bicol and buses run on schedule and all the routes at two centavos per kilometer. Uh, and Alatco buses were regularly maintained over long, uh, over long routes. Uh, traveling via bus, according to the account, traveling via bus was cheap and comfortable. He, he, the, the account even made mention of the Pamplona-Pasacao road being completed. Uh, the Alatco 
uh, created a station in Pasaka which offered trips to Naga and Albay, and it benefited the people staying in that part of Camarines Sur. And the public enjoyed, in the based on the account, the public enjoyed the courteous and cheap and reliable uh, service. But um, the passenger, and I, I also got this account that contradicted the, the cheapness, uh, the cheap travel, which is very interesting. Uh, there was actually a different passenger uh, reaction. Uh, the passenger reaction of affordable commute on the Alatco were not all the same. Uh, in the diary of uh, Luis Senrat, uh, who was a student in the 1920s, he, uh, um, a student in the 1920s, he narrated that the bus fare of two pesos for a trip from the Gaspi to Ginubatan, uh, or the bus fare was around two pesos from the Gaspi to Ginubatan. And this contradicts the previous account of Alatco's cheap fare because uh, based on the, uh, on the memoir or diary of uh, Luis General, he found the price very expensive. Maybe because of being a student, um, two pesos uh, during that time was already very expensive, uh, the trip. With a short trip from the Gaspi uh, to Ginubatan. I also got other travel accounts, uh, travel logs, uh, like the account of Walter Robb, an American businessman who depicted and uh, described his travel uh, from, um, from Manila. He went to Bicol, he rode also a train. Uh, he took the Manila South Line from the Paco station. Then he went to Albay to visit a friend and uh, he rode a bus and he was describing the, the experience. Uh, he was actually visiting one of the incorporators of Alatco, uh, si Robert Manley, uh, who was a pioneer. So, uh, of course, the, the comments or, or the, the travel log of Walter Robb uh, showcased uh, the positive impact of Alatco. And it was a really great experience for him because he was, uh, in one way, promoting the business of his, his friends. There were even travel agencies that... Um, created travel guides. Uh, this was around 1937 on how to go to Bicol. It's some sort of a, a travel log that you could reach Bicol by uh, riding the Bicol Express. Then you could transfer by a, uh, by a bus. And they even suggested uh, the way to go around Bicol was through the bus uh, because you could spare a lot of money and time if you would ride the bus. And probably this account did not, really, uh, did not describe what bus company it was, but of course, that, that was probably the bus company uh, would have been uh, Alatco. So these were the experiences. Uh, and I, I'm actually looking for more uh, bus account experiences to add up to this research. But so far, these were the initial accounts that I, that I gathered. So these are the early, early accounts. So to conclude uh, my, uh, my lecture, uh, it, it, we could say that uh, through Albert Louis Amen um, efforts, he could be dubbed as the father of transportation in the Philippines because his bus business in Bicol was the first of its kind uh, on the island. And uh, it's actually very important tracing the Alatos into institutional history uh, from its budding years to its expansion is essential to situate the struggles it endured uh, preceding its success. Uh, Amen, in, in our discussion, was, was immersed both in water and also in inland uh, transportation activities, which made him uh, uh, have two perspectives uh, from, from water to inland, and he preferred uh, that the inland travel was more conducive because of the changes in the built environment of, of Bicol. Uh, we could also um, look into uh, the impact of Alatco. Alatco was a sort, was, was not just a sort, but was an image builder for the U.S. colonial administration. The bus company exhibited uh, success of American ingenuity in transport motorization, resulting in the enhanced mobility of Naga and the rest of Bicol. Um, as the bus traversed uh, the roads, it became uh, a moving, tangible symbol of the civilizing and modernizing process driven by the American colonizers. An achievement that was supposedly implausible during the, the Spanish reign. Uh, this new symbol of mobility uh, in the region during the American colonial period, uh, the Alatco was crucial factor behind the substantial changes 
not only in the economic life, but also in the social and even in the political life or political dimensions in, in Kabikolan. Um, I actually had a, 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 an, an epilogue to this. Uh, the operation of Alatko was halted uh, when the Japanese arrived. Uh, so most of the buses were actually confiscated by the Japanese and used by the Japanese. And during the liberation, uh, Alatko uh, um, reestablished itself, uh, but was able to, to recover immediately. Uh, and um, it, it, it still uh, it, it became operational even after uh, the war. But a lot of institutional changes that happened, uh, the Tuasons actually acquired, Tuasons of Manila acquired the company, and uh, later on, um, it was renamed uh, Phil Tranco in 1984. So that uh, ends my uh, simple sharing of the history of, of Alatco. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sir Leo, for that very um, comprehensive lecture about the topic. It was a bit interesting then, because growing up, um, yung lola, yung lola ko, and then yung, ma, yung kapatid niya, used to go to Manila from time to time. Mga early 1950s, siguro 1960s. Pero at some point, nabanggit din nila, sir, yung, yung alat ko. Parang may, may ibang mode of transportation pa dati na bus. I don't, I, I, I forgot the, yung, yung, yung bus line nila. But meron din daw sa Gubat, sir, Sugon. And then meron din somewhere in Bacon. Kasi I was, I, I, I am from Bacon. So, and then eventually, nagkaroon din ng plane, tas ngayon wala ng plane, sir, so good. So, very interesting, sir. Thank you so much for um, for the lecture. I think we have a few questions from our viewers sa uh, Facebook Live. Pero, sir, this, this is clarification from Reg Haliare. Hello po. I have a question or clarification. Alatko became the pioneer of inland transportation in Bicol, not in the Philippines in general. Thank you. Same question, yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, if we would look at it, it was actually the first uh, organized uh, bus company. And in, in the in the discussion, I mentioned that uh, some companies, like the Frank Clark companies uh, or Frank uh, Emil Bacharach uh, and even Max Blaus, they were inspired by uh, uh, Alatco. So, in terms of in in inland uh, and its flexibility, we could consider Alatco as the first formal uh, organized transport transport system uh, in the Philippines. It started in Bicol and eventually we could even consider it in, in the whole uh, Philippines, in the entire archipelago during that time. You and it was clarified na. And then from Miss Faye Balanta Coleta, um, parang hindi siya question. I am from Santo Domingo, Albay. May naikwento siya sa akin na may accident yung kinasangkutan sa bayan namin ng alat ko. Maraming namatay malapit sa munisipyo natin. You and Yun sa yung kanyang comment. I think uh, I, 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 I would like to know what year. So be, Ayun, what sige, year po. the accident happened. Miss Pe, paka comment kung anong anong year siya para at least magkamahan baka magamit ni Sir sa kanyang research. Ayan, also here from Mr. Yufemi Agbayani from NHCP Sir. Magandang hapon po. Kung ang alat ko po pala ay filtrang ko ngayon. Minsan din po pala ito naging pantrangko. Uh, yes, actually, uh, the, when the Tuasons acquired it, uh, they were branching out mga, parang mga sister sister companies. And I think yung minamention mo, like Francis, yung sa Beagle, I think it was the Cal uh, company aside from Alatco because it also uh, branched out into other sub-companies. Uh, so yung pantrangko, filtrangko, uh, their uh, ownership, uh, at one point, the mga shares were actually controlled by the Tuasons. But uh, through the years, from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, there were a lot of, of changes in the in the institutional uh, control of the of the company. I see. Ito sir, comment lang from Mr. Rod Irawa. Alat ko bases po ang unang bus na nasakyan ko nung bata pa ako nung late 60s dito sa Kapalonga, Camarines Norte. Is watching from the Kapalonga Tourism and Cultural Heritage Office. Hi, Sir Rod. Afternoon. Sir Rod, medyo nostalgic, di ba? Very actually, nostalgic, sir, talaga yung topic. Kasi growing up talaga, makilola ako, sir, eh. Mm. So, yung kwento nung Manila to Sir Sugon, na mga kung paano sila sumasakay, nung oras sila babiyahe. Kasi parang this buses, kasi may 
schedule lang sila. Mm-hmm. Hindi sila kagaya na. It's very convenient for us. We have parang hourly basis yung biyahe ng mga bus and then by plane. That time, it was so hard na makapunta ng Manila, makapunta ng ibang lugar. So very nostalgic talaga yung, yung topic natin this afternoon. So I think, sir, there are no more questions. Sige, final input, sir, or final words before we end the program? Uh, since many people are actually very, in a way, nostalgic about about the, the Alatco, and I, I've actually garnered also, I collected a lot of stories because my, my focus uh, in, this, in this topic was in the early 20th century, the, the early beginnings of Alatco, which I realized no one actually uh, wrote about. Uh, it was only made mention by Gleek. So that's why one of the inspirations that I got to pursue this topic was because no one, no, no, uh, despite being considered one of the, er- the, the earliest bus company, there is no actually uh, a work uh, about it. So kumbaga, it was also a first, um, kumbaga, I take pride in, in doing this work because it also highlights Alatco and also coming from Bicol, being a Bicolano. Uh, na ding, it, it somehow counters Manila-centric perspective that development also happened in Bicol, yung Abaca industry, which also inspired uh, investments. Uh, and speaking of uh, yung mga accounts and mga experiences, I'm, I'm planning to develop the, the work and expand its uh, scope. So maybe if you want, you could reach out uh, or I could reach out to you and you could also share your narratives uh, about your experience. Kasi ako personally, uh, sa bus experience, my, my very first bus that I rode was actually uh, Filtranco din. My, my first trip, I, I think I was around uh, elementary years. When I took the, the bus from Naga to Manila, it was actually, a, a, you know, not really a traumatic experience, but very, uh, uh, I, was, I was not, we could say traumatic because my first bus experience ko as a kid, as a child, Manila, uh, from Naga to Manila, uh, I got car sick the entire trip. So every time I see a bus, parang yan yung na-imagine ko. Lalo na yung, ano, yung, um, yung may air freshener na Christmas tree. Bicol, being a I hated that. Uh, uh, the, the mere sight it, of that, how... ano, that, that Christmas tree na parang air freshener, I would immediately get get sick. Uh, luck, uh, I think pinanggal niya ngayon ng mga bus later on. Wala na mga air fresheners yung karamihan. But because I really got gas. So isa pa ata yun sa nag motivates sa akin. But if you got stories of bus accounts or even primary documents because I, I, I encountered people that their father or their grandparents worked in the Alatco as drivers. At yan. And uh, another thing also, uh, yung Alatco, uh, we actually have an Alatco Museum in Iriga. But unfortunately, when the, the building was raised by the typhoon and uh, wala na yung actual museum, but I asked the ma- manager recently uh, maybe LGU Iriga could do something about it. Maybe they could restore uh, the, the museum uh, because in the process of doing this research, when I visited uh, the, the museum, uh, the, artifacts are, the artifacts are not stored uh, in, in the museum. It was kept in an abandoned bus. So baka masira or maanasayang naman. So maybe the local government or even Filtranco could actually manage the uh, keepings, the safe keepings of, or even NHCP siguro could, could, could help uh, po para ma, ma preserve din yung ibang mga artifacts po doon sa, sa Filtranco Museum. And ma, ma- re-establish siya sa, sa Iriga din. Yan po. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Again, thank you for your time. Now, um, we proceed to the presentation of certificate. Um, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, Manila, this certificate of part of appreciation is given to Professor Leo Paolo Imperial, Assistant Professor in the Department of Social Sciences of the Ateneo Dag University, for his invaluable contribution as resource speaker in the webinar entitled Alatco: Developments in Public Transport in Bicol During the Early 20th Century, held on July 4, 2020, via Facebook page of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Signed. Herminda R. Arevalo, the officer in charge of the Office of the Executive Director of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Thank you, sir. So Thank before you. we finally end this lecture, we'd like to um, express our sincere gratitude to our um, National Historical Commission of the Philippines family, um, headed by our chairman, Dr. Rene R. Escalante, and Executive Director, Herminda Arevalo, also to Ma'am Gina Batuhan, to Sir Brian Paraiso, and, I, and to our Ilocos Norte.